Man, what an amazing time of worship that we've had. I hope that you have enjoyed being there in your pajamas and worshiping the Lord or whatever it is that you look like today, uh, worshiping God in your homes, uh, in your car, wherever it was. Such a great, incredible time of worship. So grateful for our praise team and our praise band for leading us. Well, today I want uh, us, as we continue in our sermon series called Unlikely Witnesses, I want us uh, to focus in and really think about our lives. With everything that's going on in our nation and in our world, people are afraid, people are scared, people are frightened, but there's, there's also other people that feel like they're at the end of their rope. There are other people that feel completely hopeless and devastated right now. There are people that feel disappointed. Uh, there are people that feel as though they have stopped hoping for anything good to happen in their lives because so much bad has already happened to their lives. They have stopped hoping for good. They don't feel like they deserve it. They don't feel like anything good is going to come to them. They feel as though they're at the very, very end of their rope. I want to tell you a story about a man who was arrested for murder. Now, no mistake about it, he was absolutely guilty. The judge uh, found him guilty, the jury found him guilty, and they sentenced him to death and to die by the electric chair. So he waited day after day on death row, waiting for his life to end. Then one day he received word that they were ready uh, for him. And so they marched him down the hallway They in his shackles. They led him to the chair. They shaved his head. They put the cap on him. They bound his hands and feet and blindfolded him. But the story does not end the way that you think it does. Right before the switch was thrown, the son of the man that he had murdered came out of the crowd of witnesses. He unshackled the murderer. He unshackled him from his chair and he leaned over and whispered in his ear, I forgive you. And then he set the man free. He sat down in the electric chair and the executioner threw the switch. Now, I know what you're thinking. That story sounds crazy. That story sounds absurd. There's no way that that actually happened. But the truth is, a story similar to that happened 2,000 years ago, and it has been changing lives since then. So today, as we continue in our sermon series, Unlikely Witnesses, we are going to take a fast 20-minute look at Barabbas. Uh, Barabbas was a man who had an unusual encounter with Jesus at the cross. Jesus had been arrested, he had been beaten, he had been mocked, and now he stood before Pilate and Pilate presented the people with a choice. We're gonna begin reading in Mark chapter 15 and we'll read verses six through 15. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews, Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, if you're Barabbas, talk about your lucky break. Uh, Barabbas was facing the cruelest form of punishment known to man at the time. He was prepared to die for what he had done and not just die, he was prepared to be tortured to death. 
make no mistake about it, Barabbas was a murderer who was set free. Now we read from time to time in today's uh, society about how murderers are accidentally set free, whether they're uh, accidentally or intentionally set free, the system releases a murderer onto the streets. It, it bothers us when that happens. We, we place ourselves in the shoes of the families of the person that uh, had committed that or who had been killed at the hands of that murderer. And we don't like it. We're uncomfortable with it. Would you be comfortable if Barabbas had murdered one of your family members and he was set free? Of course not. You wouldn't like it. Nobody would like it. And Barabbas was guilty. He had taken the life of somebody else and he deserved to be punished by death. He expected to die a slow, agonizing death on the cross, and he had no idea what to expect next. So Pilate stood up. He offered a deal to the crowd of the Jewish people. Who do you want me to set free? Jesus, the great miracle worker. Jesus, the one who walked on water. Jesus, the one who healed the sick. Jesus, the one who gave life, who restored life to the dead and healed people of their diseases. Do you want me to release Jesus, the, the giver of life? Or do you want me to release Barabbas, the taker of life? I'm sure he thought that the choice was simple. One who takes life or one who gives life. And I'm sure he's thinking, of course, these Jewish people are going to, they're, they're obviously, they want Jesus to be set free. But those religious leaders stirred up the crowd in such a way, they stirred him up into a frenzy, and they demanded that Jesus be crucified and Barabbas be set free. The crowd chose to set the murderer free, and that choice that they made meant that Jesus was innocent but died in place of Barabbas. See, Jesus had not been found guilty of any crime. When Pilate asked the crowd, why, what crime has he committed, nobody was able to answer him. Jesus, an innocent man, took the place of Barabbas on the cross. Jesus did not deserve the torture that he was about to experience. Uh, just like the story that I told at the beginning of the message, the substitution of Barabbas makes no sense. But from the perspective of Jesus, the exchange, his life for Barabbas' life, makes all the sense in the world. Think about how the gospel writers framed the life and the actions of Jesus. They framed throughout the gospels from, from Matthew to the end of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel writers portrayed Jesus as a friend of sinners. Throughout the New Testament gospels, the, the men who wrote about the life of Jesus seemed fascinated with Jesus' friendship us sinners. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, and if you have some time, read through the Gospel of Luke, and you're going to find story after story after story after story of Jesus interacting with sinful people, people known as sinners, and being criticized for it. In Luke 7:34, Jesus was characterized, and he was speaking about how he had been characterized, and he said, you call me a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and a friend of sinners because so much of his life was spent with sinners. In Luke 15, 1, uh, the gospel writer Luke writes, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Over and over and over and over again, it's emphasized by the men who studied his life and knew Jesus best, that Jesus went out of his way to hang out with sinners. Jesus shied away from the religious people who felt superior to everybody, and he sought to build friendships with those people who were rejected by the religious leaders. 
So it shouldn't surprise us in any way that now Jesus is standing before Barabbas and Jesus exchanges his life for the life of a murderer because Jesus had spent his entire life investing in sinners, loving on sinners, hanging out with sinners. He lived among sinners and he died among sinners. And not only, would his, well, not only would Jesus live his life among notorious sinners and people at the end of their rope, the hopeless, the helpless, the discouraged, but he did die among them too. This story of Jesus trading places with Barabbas reminds me that I am Barabbas. Romans 3.23 is very clear about all people Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You know that Jesus would have been hanging out with me because I am a sinner and a notorious sinner sometimes. But I'm a sinner. Romans 6.23 tells me that because of my sin, I deserve the death penalty. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. Everyone has sinned. Now, I know what you're thinking. I started off this message saying, hey, this is a message for those who feel hopeless. This is a message for those who feel like that they're at the end of their rope. You and I can find comfort in this. While God has a very high expectation and a very high standard and God expects perfection, there is not one person on the planet who has ever been able to live up to that expectation. Not the rich, not the religious, not the poor, not the good, not the bad. You sin, I sin, I am Barabbas. I have not murdered anybody, but... I have hated people in my heart. And the Bible says that that's just as bad. I've not led a rebellion, but I have rebelled against God in refusing to follow him. I deserve the eternal death and the punishment for my sin. But here's what I want you to understand. Jesus did not come to beat you up and make you feel guilty and bad about your life. Jesus did not die on the cross to make you feel discouraged and hopeless and make you feel like you are a terrible person. See, that's what the religious leaders were doing to those notorious sinners. They cast them out. They wouldn't let them worship in the temple. And Jesus said, hey, I'm your friend. I want you to learn to follow me. I love you completely. See, Jesus hasn't shown up in your life uh, because he wants to make you feel like a terrible person. Jesus didn't become known as a friend of sinners because he made people feel bad around him. Jesus wasn't known as a friend of sinners because he was criticizing them and making them feel guilty and terrible about their lives. See, the year was 1991 when I understood that Jesus took my punishment. Uh, Peter explained the cross this way. When Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, was talking about the cross, Jesus, uh, Peter explained it this way. He said in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. See, do you see the, brute, the, the beauty of the crucifixion? Jesus exchanged his life for yours, not to make you feel guilty, not to make you feel hopeless, not to make you feel despairing. Uh, Jesus exchanged his life for your life to bring you safely home to God. That's good news. He died so you can have hope. He died so you can have peace. He died so you can be forgiven for your sins. He did not die on the cross to make you feel guilty or beat you up. He died on the cross substituting for you because he loves 
you completely and totally. Paul explained this passage of Scripture, the cross. Paul explained it another way in Romans 5, 10 through 11. He writes this, Our friendship with God was was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. Did you catch that? Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Through his death, Jesus made me a friend of God. And a friend is a very good thing to have. If you've ever felt alone, if you've ever felt broken, but you have a friend, you receive comfort, don't you? When you are afraid, a friend can help you find peace through having a conversation with them. When you are tired of life, a friend can come along beside you and encourage you and help you to press on. And God is a friend who will go with you wherever you go. You may feel like your friends have all abandoned you. You may feel like your friends are never there for you, but God is not a friend like that. God is a friend because of what Jesus did for the cross. He is an everlasting, eternal friend. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, have I accepted the friendship of God? It may be that you attend church. That's what religious people do. Have you accepted the friendship of of God that Paul outlines in Romans 5? Have you accepted the friendship of God through the death of Jesus? See, Romans 10, 9, Paul wrote, and he said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, if you understand that Jesus did die on the cross for your sins, if you understand that Jesus is a friend of sinners, if you are ready to turn away from the hopelessness and the brokenness of this life, Jesus is ready to be your friend for all eternity. See, he didn't come to beat you up. He didn't come to make you feel guilty. He came to be your friend and to love you and to encourage you That's the very same thing that he did when he walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. And now he wants to walk with you in life. So if you feel like you're at the end of your rope, know this. Jesus loves you. And you have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. But have you accepted his friendship? I want us to take a minute right now. You're sitting in your living room. You're in your car wherever you are, wherever you are watching, you're listening to my voice, I want to invite you to surrender your life to God right now, not out of guilt, but out of love for what Jesus did for you. I want you to bow your head and I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to pray something like this. Dear God, I'm at the end of my rope. I understand that I am a sinner and I understand that I deserve the death that Jesus paid for me. I understand that you expected perfection and I couldn't give it to you, but Jesus did, which is why he died in my place. I ask you to forgive me for my sin and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and my Savior. I want to enter into a lifelong friendship with you And I commit my life to you and receive Jesus as my Savior. If you just prayed to give your life to Jesus right now, well, the Bible says that you are born again. I'm excited for you. You're actually made a brand new person. That now Jesus is a friend of this brand new person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
old life has passed away and all life has become new. You have been changed. You've been transformed on the inside. You are not the same person that you were when you first began listening to this sermon. God has transformed your life. He has changed you. He has given you hope. He has forgiven you for your sins. And you can now call Jesus your very close friend. If you prayed to give your life to Jesus, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Right around me on the screen, if you're watching online at calvarylhc.com, right around me, there's a button that says, raise your hand. And that button is there. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, we want to invite you to click on that button and send us some contact information. We want to know your name and we want to know how we can be praying for you and we want to rejoice with you. Another way that you can let us know is you can go to our website, calvarylhc.com, go to our contact page and enter your information in there. And finally, if you're watching this by Facebook, we want to invite you to send us a message and let us know through our Facebook page that you just became a friend of Jesus and you committed your life to him. Then we wanna see you get baptized as well. And we wanna help you grow and read your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we wanna make sure that you have one. But we wanna do everything that we can to help follow up with you so that you can live this new life in Jesus victoriously. Well, thanks so much for tuning in today. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. And our band at this time is gonna come and lead us in our closing song.